Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning into today's interview. I'm joined with Dr. Stephen Liss, who is Ryerson University's Vice President of Research and Innovation, as well as a Professor of Chemistry and Biology. His return to Ryerson in 2017 follows a decade of distinguished service um, at the University of Guelph and at Queen's University, where he served as Vice Principal of Research and a Professor of Environmental Studies and Chemical Engineering since 2010. For his contributions to Canada's research and innovation ecosystem, Stephen was awarded the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal in 2012. And he's also held positions on numerous boards, including Chair of Ontario Council on University Research, the Chair of the Board of Management of Triumph, Founding Co-Chair of the Leadership Council on Digital Infrastructure, and Founding Board Member and Corporate Officer of Compute Canada, as well as the Inaugural Chair of the Review Panel for the Ministry of Research and Innovation, Ontario Research Fund Research Excellence Program. So with that, I want to start by asking you, Stephen, how is it that your education or background tie into what you are doing right now? Well, uh, good morning, and uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, to, to chat and uh, to share some ideas of uh, where we're heading and, um, and, and across Canada and the role of the universities in particular. But uh, uh, yeah, I don't think in, in many ways, uh, you know, I, I could say that uh, my background in training is late. Uh, prepared me in, in specifically with respect to what I'm doing now or, or even some of the, the, the challenges that uh, uh, I'm, we're facing. Um, but on the other hand, um, it, it, it did by virtue of the uh, uh, orientation to research and, uh, the, and what uh, takes place around research in terms of uh, critical thinking, um, uh, addressing you know, challenging wicked problems, uh, Facing disappointments along the way, and uh, but also uh, a love of the uh, of the university, uh, the transformative experiences that uh, take place for students, undergraduate and graduate students, and uh, and of course, I mean, there's a, aspects of my disciplinary focus and uh, and uh, research interests that uh, you know cross uh, the uh, intersections and of disciplines and professions, and of course, uh, address uh, you know societal issues and and uh, as well. So. So, um, you know, putting all that together and uh, and looking at how important the universities are in preparing, um, uh, and preparing the next generation of talent, but also uh, the underlying work that takes place in the university that's so critical to the uh, uh, socioeconomic uh, uh, condition in our country, but also uh, preparing individuals to be part of a civil society, uh, but also to be part of a global world. And so when you pull all those things together, I think uh, there's many aspects of what, you know, transpires in uh, one's university education and uh, the work that uh, you do when you actually become an academic and, uh, and uh, uh, enter a, a different role in the university. So with all of that, I think uh, it uh, in many ways uh, prepared me, it prepared me to also, um, you know, to be... Uh, um, to be mindful of the thing, of the fact that things change, right? And uh, what you do uh, tomorrow may not be what you're being doing today, and uh, and what you're doing five years down the road, I mean, that's just sort of going to be uh, what you've thought you were going to be doing. So um, all of that, uh, I think, has uh, set the stage for uh, a, quite a dynamic and exciting and interesting um, uh, uh, career, but also an important opportunity. And I think for for young faculty coming into the academy and those who are seeking to work in university. Um, it's a remarkable opportunity to contribute and to be engaged. But there's, I think, a greater need for universities to be more front and present, particularly with respect to policy um, in, in particular. Mm -hmm. And continuing on with uh, your academic background, which you touched on earlier, and as part of your um, experiences, you were able to recently participate as a moderator on the academic session at CSPC's Symposium on the Federal Budget for 2021. How did that go? Uh, what were the biggest takeaways? Well, it's always a, a great opportunity to be able to sit around and hear others uh, talk uh, uh, on the panel and to hear um, a particular perspectives. So I think I take great satisfaction not so much in hearing my voice or or thinking that this is a platform for me to participate in uh, advancing a particular point of view, but. Uh, uh, but it gets it, it, what's most important about uh, of that opportunity is 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 the the, is the dynamic uh, perspectives and uh, exchange of information. But um, really, in real time, uh, you know, trying to uh, dive into the key salient features of a 
of a of a budget announcement um, in the context of uh, you know the support for uh, you know science. So when I say science, I say broadly uh, 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 the social sciences and humanities and uh, uh, and all the underlying uh, work that's so incredibly important to advancing evidence uh, and uh, advancing uh, the economy and uh, the opportunities for our country and for people. And um, and so uh, I, 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 it's a privilege to 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 have that uh, that opportunity. And uh, it's not the first time I've been in but a uh, conversation uh, at, at uh, following a budget announcement with CSPC. And so uh, really delighted uh, to um, to have that opportunity. But also I get to sit there and really think about the detailed analysis that others are providing to uh, to understand uh, what the budget uh, is uh, is uh, is getting at, and then looking at and how it ties into particular aspects of strategy, long-term vision, uh, looking at historically, um, and then looking at uh, also where the gaps may be and, uh, and, and what we need to be focused on with our respect to our engagement government. I mean, there's lots of opportunities when you look at a budget, and, uh, but at the same time, there's an opportunity to also be very, to look at it very critically and to uh, understand it that way as well. So uh, I value the opportunity to be there, to be able to focus on that and to hear, uh, you know, hear others uh, as, as well and to, to bring that into my own thinking too. So it's a real privilege to be able to have that opportunity. Thanks, that's a, that's a great answer. Now, um, in light of both the current COVID-19 pandemic and the federal budget, uh, can you tell me a little bit about what universities have done and specifically what Ryerson University has done to address the pandemic uh, institutionally and in the context of research? Uh, yeah, so thank you. Uh, Listen, it's been a tumultuous uh, time, a tremendously dynamic time, and uh, one that was is mixed with opportunity uh, and challenges. And uh, I think the universities have to be seen to be able to have, uh, uh, you know, have, have had to deal with all of that. And uh, so, on on one hand, um, you know, what I think was particularly clear for most universities across the country and for all Canadians to understand is how quickly the universities were able to pivot to continue to maintain continuity uh, with respect to the research enterprise. So that was one really key feature of the work that was uh, necessary. Um, of course, there was a migration of, uh, of uh, teaching and, and learning to uh, a virtual environment, but uh, aspects of research and uh, laboratory-based research on campus continued and the universities really focused on how to ensure that to be able to do that safely and securely um, and to maintain continuity. Uh, in that respect, um, while uh, uh, there was activities that continued and there were many opportunities specific to addressing COVID related problems, uh, whether it was the earliest days of provision of PPE uh, and uh, resources and supplies that universities were, were very quick to be able to make available, but also to uh, make space available for particular initiatives to develop new approaches to PPE and, uh, and uh, meet the needs of uh, of uh, the pandemic at the very earliest stages. Uh, there were researchers who were drawn from a variety of disciplines and, uh, and perspectives who may not necessarily have been working on research directly related to uh, a public health issue such as a pandemic or even biomedical, but brought a whole range of other expertise that created new opportunities. Uh, but we did see uh, particular areas of research uh, and scholars and, and, and researchers at our university um, at, a, uh, uh, at the focal point of initiatives uh, and uh, an opportunity uh, to be able to contribute and on COVID related issues. And so uh, that was important. And the university also made uh, particular investments to support that as well. Um, and uh, so that was, uh, that was important, uh, of course, uh, at Ryerson with uh, with our work on future skills uh, uh, and uh, and then supporting uh, the student work uh, 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 workplace pro uh, placement program uh, that was particularly important in ensuring students had employment opportunities and resources available. Um, the universities uh, created all sorts of ways to ensure students could be supported and uh, uh, through a very difficult time. Uh, that was a, another aspect. The, the other you know, part of the equation, though, is that uh, that uh, people's lives were impacted. Uh, we had to rec we have to recognize that uh, we're about people, and people's lives were disrupted, and uh, they were difficult times. And in many instances, uh, people could not necessarily keep the same pace uh, and focus on aspects of research intensity and uh, and with online teaching uh, and uh, and uh, personal circumstances, be it. Uh, Health related issues as arising from the pandemic. Uh, there's tremendous amount of tragedy and uh, and uh, difficulty. There 
there were people whose partners lost jobs. Uh, there were uh, children who, whose, uh, whose care uh, migrated from the in-school experience to the to being at home, uh, impacting people's uh, ability to uh, to be able to keep uh, the uh, focus on, on on all aspects of what they were doing. Um, and uh, we had to there had to be a tremendous amount of accommodation and recognition of of those circumstances and working collectively across the university system with uh, counterparts to we'll work with the tri-agencies and federal government to ensure that uh, you know, uh, there was extension of uh, uh, timelines, deadlines, uh, some accommodation, additional resources that could be made available to support people, and even including resources the university was able to make available to support people. Um, there was just a whole range of things to, to consider. And I think universities, well, not it wasn't perfect. And we know that uh, it, it, there was a very strong a symmetric uh, impact across the, the, the academy and across, across the university, impacting staff, students, and faculty. And uh, we know from our own surveys that uh, the pandemic took its toll and um, that we're there to support people and uh, as well, and, uh, and, and, and importantly, supporting people uh, as a primary uh, concern. And uh, in this respect, uh, it wasn't as, uh, as uh, smooth uh, for everybody, uh, but we try to, to find ways to help and uh, uh, and support people the best way we could. Uh, like I said, it wasn't always perfect. Uh, we were learning along the way, uh, but I think uh, it was a, a important to think to recognize it wasn't all about growth and opportunity, although we were really, but it, it, but I think it should have demonstrated to, to, to Canada how important universities are uh, in terms of the resources and uh, capacity and expertise that they have that they can be called upon uh, to be uh, to be able to uh, respond but at the same time we are uh, organizations uh, focused on people and uh, we had to work to help support people as well well as you say people's lives have different definitely been affected by the pandemic and um as a result, uh, the university's response was quite strong. Can you briefly comment a little bit more just on how this shifted the public perception of science and um, if it has influenced uh, public policy at all? Well, yeah, so I'm going to draw upon an uh, uh, initiative that we established at Ryerson over the course of the year, actually, um, and it was independent of the pandemic. In fact, the idea of uh, this uh, preceded the pandemic, but we have been very interested in uh, harnessing the constellation of activity uh, across our own university, but to also um, diverse uh, to to um, to uh, include more uh, underrepresented voices in in policy discussion and uh, and as as our as we recognize at our university with respect to initiatives like the Brookfield Institute or the Leadership Lab. Uh, or particular areas of uh, work going on in migration and uh, and political studies and diversity and so forth that uh, we had we had we were at the precipice of a of an important opportunity to contribute further to uh, public discourse and policy debate and policy development at the federal and, and provincial and municipal levels as well and uh, we felt there was a real what we needed to be doing is uh, more at our university is to find ways to amplify our voice with respect to policy so we undertook a, um, a, 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 undertook a a review but also through a task force to look at how best to uh, uh, harness the constellation of activity across the university to increase the diversity of voices at the table and uh, and and uh, and harness the constellation of activity to even be more effective in uh, in policy and I think it's, it behooves uh, uh, all of us to think about how how we can better uh, advance knowledge mobilization and uh, bring evidence to bear on the work that's going across uh, a tremendous range of uh, diverse areas of study and at the intersections of important important. Uh, 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 and uh, policy uh, discussions for which there is, I think, a significant gap uh, in terms of at least the government's uh, ability to uh, uh, to address these. And I think there uh, there's tremendous resources and diversity of, of thought and ideas. And how do you amplify those voices, get more people involved and so forth? So we undertook our own uh, task force. We were fortunate to have uh, Matthew Mendelson, a visiting professor, uh, join us who came out of the uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, Privy Council and uh, PMO's office, uh, but had long standing history at the, uh, having established the MOAT uh, at U of T and then uh, was a colleague at, at mine at, at Queen's and School of Policy Studies. 
uh, and uh, joining us as a visiting professor. Uh, we were um, uh, brought together quite a range of uh, people across the campus and to really uh, start amplifying uh, uh, the voices. And, uh, and I will say the specific with respect to the pandemic was the first policy response initiative that was, uh, was uh, led by uh, uh, the Brookfield uh, Institute, uh, the leadership lab at Ryerson, and, as well as with Matthew's involvement as well, that was particularly focused on the on, the, on matters pertaining to the pandemic and then looking post pandemic as well. So um, the policy was really at the forefront of our thinking in so many different ways. Um, and in fact, uh, it has been uh, the forefront of our, our thinking with respect to health and health uh, research and uh, health uh, professions and, uh, the get, and the important gaps and cracks in the healthcare system, particularly around community health. And, uh, and uh, that became a significant feature with respect to our advancement of a new uh, school of medicine uh, that Ryerson will launch um, and working closely with the provincial government. Uh, to, uh, to, uh, to position uh, Ryerson as an agent of change in the future of healthcare and the uh, next generation of health practitioners who will have to work very differently um, and uh, than they, they have in the past. And, uh, uh, you know, there's, I think, many opportunities for universities to really look critically at their, their strengths, their opportunities, their engagement with community. Um, that's been particularly important. And I think our connection to community um, and working closely with, uh, with, our, with communities and, and peoples uh, uh, in not only neighboring our institution, but uh, in, in, the, in the work that we do, um, that is so incredibly important to understanding the critical needs and how universities can best adapt. Well, thank you for your answer. And I'm going to pivot a little bit here. But uh, speaking on your earlier point with uh, engaging with diversity, um, after a consultation with the Standing Strong Task Force earlier this year, the Board of Governors at Ryerson University announced that it will be changing the university's name to separate itself from its uh, namesakes, colonial associations. How do, you, how do you envision this name change affecting the, universe, uh, the university's research and an academic environment going forward? Well, I think uh, uh, a couple of things to be uh, to be to to reflect on this is that um, you know that uh, you know Ryerson has 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 continuously evolved. It's a, a, a relatively a, a younger institution um, amongst the uh, Canadian post secondary system or within the Canadian post secondary system, but it's always been at the forefront of 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 change uh, evolution. Um, uh, it's been flexible. It's been agile. But it's also an institution that has, I think, been very much, uh, uh, you know, uh, connected to to community and to um, uh, and to and to and to people. Um, I think uh, you know one has to to think about it in that way. And uh, with Ryerson continuing to evolve, uh, there's an opportunity to think about how best to represent uh, the university's future. Um, let's be clear. Um, I think the the uh, the, the Ryerson found itself at a very important uh, juncture in, in, the, in Canadian history. Uh, and, uh, you know, Ryerson and Edgerton Ryerson became a flashpoint, rightly or wrongly. Uh, and, uh, you know, the task force uh, re, uh, released its, uh, its, uh, its findings and recommendations. Um, and, of course, you know, uh, the institution, the university has evolved to a brand and a position that uh, is well regarded and uh, independent of, an, of understanding the connection of the Ryerson name to an individual who was part of a, an early time in Canada that, uh, uh, that uh, laid the foundation of uh, many of the uh, injustices and the uh, horrible uh, 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 events that uh, transpired uh, following the establishment of the residential schools, um, and um, and and I think you know uh, it reflects Canada's uh, need to uh, you know uh, be mindful of its responsibilities with respect to uh, truth reconciliation and the recommendations and then the implementation. Uh, it's incumbent upon us with respect to our own institutions' obligations, and um, and then at the same time. Uh, uh, you know, charting a meaningful path forward, and I think that's the that's the key aspect of of, of, of not only reconciliation but embracing uh, a diverse community. Um, and so, 
well, the Standing Strong Task Force had a particular orientation to one particular issue. The, the naming of the university reflects a, 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 an entirely different engagement with regards to the community and in, in, uh, in coming together to find a path forward and, uh, and a name that will serve the institution well and reflect its future um, while celebrating its past and acknowledging its history and, uh, and reflecting on its history and the implications of uh, commemoration and, and individuals. So uh, I think this is a chance for community to come together and uh, to chart a path forward. And Ryerson is a tremendously diverse institution um, and reflective of, uh, of, of a trajectory of uh, communities and peoples who uh, um, you know, reflect uh, the, one of the most diverse uh, uh, cities and regions in the world. And, um, and Ryerson is a, is a very diverse and, and uh, an inclusive institution as we would want to be. This reflects, I think, the next evolution in the institution's uh, trajectory, and the name should um, should will be seen to be bringing people together rather than focusing on a name that would uh, be have been seen to be increasingly more divisive with respect to the community. So um, I just think that uh, this is an opportunity to to really look to the future and to chart a future together, and that's one of the challenges. When I read the land acknowledgement um, for our university, I, I always comment on on why we read it and what and what it reminds us of in terms of uh, the responsibilities we have. And part of that is to chart a, a meaningful path forward, uh, not only with the indigenous community, but with uh, with the representation of of, of all peoples and uh, uh, who come to uh, our, our university and who are represented in Canada and the, the wonderful diversity and uh, that's represented there to create that inclusion of uh, uh, community that's so necessary for uh, moving forward and to creating a better world ahead of us. So um, I'd like to think that uh, that's, uh, that's uh, uh, an outcome that I'm hopeful of uh, in this, e this exercise. I will uh, take, uh, I was, I'll say it was an honor to, to have to be one of the co-executive co-leads in supporting the two co-chairs um, along with uh, Denise and Neil Green. Um, and, uh, but I really would like to, to you know, uh, commend uh, the work of uh, Catherine Ellis and Joanne Dallaire and uh, the entire uh, Standing Strong Task Force. It was a very difficult um, uh, time. And of course it, uh, it uh, took place what well uh, well into the that period of uh, tremendous uh, challenges and uh, and uh, difficulties uh, for Canada and for communities uh, who we, uh, became aware or or, or uh, of the uh, unmarked graves and uh, and uh, and uh, the impact of the residential schools had, uh, but also clearly a reminder of how little uh, has been done thus far to address the issues and uh, and to chart that meaningful path forward. So this is Ryerson's opportunity to lead, I think, and um, and that's uh, something we look forward to uh, working. And that's a, that there's a, as you know a committee that's been established, and uh, uh, the provost of uh, Jennifer Simpson is, is chairing. Uh, along with Tony DeMello as a co-chair at the Ryerson with a, a broad uh, representation of community members, but not to choose the name, but to, to help and assist in the process to uh, path leading to the selection of that name that will be, the university will make. So um, that's uh, something we look forward to. Well, it, <clears throat> it does sound, as you say, that uh, the university is moving down into a better direction. So thank you for answering such a delicate question. And of course, the CSBC is very thankful for the support of the university. And, uh, and for your support as an active member of the CSPC community. Uh, we're heading towards the end of this interview. So I just wanted to ask you, what do you see as the biggest benefit and uh, value of attending and supporting the CSPC? Is there anything in particular that you're looking forward to at this year's conference? Uh, well, I look forward to every year's conference as Ryerson has uh, been a, a very proud sponsor and uh, commend the leadership of and my dad's leadership and the, and the entire team for really the um, leadership, I think, in bringing uh, policy discussions uh, to the forefront. Um, I, I think what has been striking for me is that each year uh, CSPC uh, takes it up a, a, another level um, and uh, brings a strong and powerful voices uh, and leading experts across the country, but also opening up opportunities for young uh, talent and uh, uh, and uh, students to be engaged and to be involved at the forefront of policy discussions. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, I think this is uh, always uh, uh, so important, and particularly these days. Uh, I can't think of uh, the 
the, the need more so than we've ever had for uh, the kinds of conversations that take place. Um, but I think what's in, 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 uh, important to, uh, to remind us is so that we also need to be constantly looking back to the conversations we had the previous year and to see what kind of progress we're making with respect to uh, addressing some of the significant challenges and, uh, and or uh, seeing where the new insights and, um, and uh, opportunities are to address some of these uh, wicked challenges and, cha uh, and, and important questions for our country but also to, to have some fun along the way as well and to engage with uh, a diverse community of, of, of academics across the country, but also government, uh, a private sector and not-for-profit organizations who have a very strong interest in ensuring that this country is the best it can be. And um, I think uh, uh, the, the types of uh, topics and uh, people that are drawn to, to this is uh, reflective of the increasing uh, um, importance of the, the role that CSPC has in convening, but also in advancing uh, uh, policy and uh, discussions and, uh, and uh, advancing the position of, uh, of, of, uh, of where universities in particular uh, have an opportunity to, to, to contribute. And, uh, and uh, we should be looking you know, deeper into our institutions. And I'm very excited by the tremendous amount of young talent that exists in our institutions that are coming to our institutions, new faculty, students, um, and our staff that uh, you know uh, provide uh, an opportunity to, uh, to to contribute and uh, and uh, that's that's so important. So uh, yeah, it's, I've always looked forward to the CSPC, and uh, no doubt that this year will be uh, as as good as it uh, as as previous years. You know, I think we all would welcome an opportunity where we can get together and uh, be uh, be present. But at the same time, we have to appreciate that. Uh, I think the uh, the, the the way which we've been able to uh, continue with CSPC's activities, um, you know, permits a, a opportunity for for those who may not be able to travel to participate and engage. Um, but uh, yeah, I have to say we will all look forward to the time to get together again, and because sometimes those important conversations don't happen necessarily at the at the panel sessions, but they happen at the coffee breaks and uh, the sidebar conversations that take place between sessions. And um, we'll look forward to the return to that uh, in due course. But uh, it's always exciting. Well, I'm glad you're looking forward to this year's conference. And of course, we're looking forward to seeing you at this year's virtual conference. Um, once again, I'd like to thank you in participating in today's interview. And I'd like to thank you, the viewer, for tuning in. Great. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Hello.